Thank you, Holly. We acknowledge that we are on the unseceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush Ohlone have never seceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. Back to you, Holly. Thank you, Eric. So welcome, everyone. We are super excited to have you. Very grateful that you're joining us on this Thursday evening. We know there's many other things you could be doing. So thank you. Uh, we are here as the Center for Social Justice at Glide coming to talk about this powerful book, The Riders Come Out at Night, Brutality, Corruption, and Cover-Up in Oakland. Ollie Winston and Darwin Von Graham are the authors, and they illuminate American police culture and the struggle for reform by using Oakland as a case study. Through the lens of the city's police department, the authors trace Oakland's history from its inception through the Palmer Raids, McCarthyism, the Civil Rights Movement, the Black Panthers, and the crack era to its current revival. It tells the story of a single city and its police force, but it also tells the story of American policing and its future. Over 21 years of fearless reporting have culminated in the writers come out at night, brutality, corruption, and cover up in Oakland. And so this is the book of the year. In, in my opinion, it is absolutely the book of the year. So if you have read it, what a treat that we're gonna be in conversation with Ali and Darwin tonight. If you haven't read it, you will read it after, after this evening and I promise you, you won't be disappointed. I'm gonna introduce Ali, Darwin and Eliana. Ali Winston is an independent reporter covering criminal justice, privacy and extremism. A former reporter for the New York Times, he also has been a fellow at Type Investigations and reported documentaries for BBC Panorama and PBS Frontline. His reporting on police corruption, white right-wing extremism and surveillance have earned him several honors, including a George Polk Award for local reporting, an Alfred I. DuPont Award and a News and Documentary Emmy. So welcome Ali Winston, so grateful to have you. Darwin Vaughn Graham. Darwin is the news editor for the Oakland side. Amazing journalism happening at the Oakland side. Before joining the Oakland side, he worked with The Appeal and The Guardian covering policing and gun violence. He was a staff writer for the East Bay Express from 2015 to 2018. I think that's when I met you. He holds a doctorate in sociology from UC Santa Barbara and was the co-recipient of the George Polk Award for local reporting in 2017. You can follow him on Twitter at Darwin Bond. Eliana Bender. Eliana is the policy associate for Glide's Center for Social Justice. Before joining Glide in 2021, she worked in eviction prevention at the Homeless Advocacy Project, as well as in nonprofit and local government settings in Berkeley, San Francisco, and Sacramento. Eliana also was in the Emerging Leaders Program at Glide when she was in college. And in her work, she advocates for changes to oppressive and discriminatory institutional structures and laws to benefit Glide's clients and marginalized people in San Francisco and across the state. So let's welcome everyone. So excited to have you all here. Let's get into it. Y'all ready? Sure. All right. So Ali and Darwin, You've focused much of your journalistic careers on Oakland government and policing. Can you tell us about what drew you to focus your reporting in this area and when and how you got started? You want me to go first? All right. Um, so I was a reporter uh, straight out of college. Um, I'm from back east of New York City. And I, after a couple of years of working at Northern New Jersey newspapers, uh, doing general assignment, I figured out that I was pretty good at doing, at covering criminal, the criminal justice system, um, all aspects of it. It was really, 
Uh, I wouldn't say that I will not deny that David Simon's The Wire and the kind of perspective is like big spiraling, you know, wide angle to sharp focus perspective that he brought on the criminal justice system. At first as a reporter and then as a screenwriter, um, that did inspire me. And it made me realize you can use this one system to examine so many other aspects of American society because we have, for better or for worse, probably definitely for worse, stripped down so many other aspects of our government while putting so much money and time and manpower into um, the criminal justice system. So when I moved out to UC, to California, to the East Bay in 2008 to study um, investigative reporting at Cal at UC Berkeley, um, I very quickly, I was asking around for stories and people said, listen, you know, the Oakland Police Department, it's a really interesting place. They're under federal, over, they're under court oversight. They keep messing up. Um, it's not really going anywhere. There's a series of really bad shootings that happen there to look into that. So I started poking around and learning how to do public record act requests and really working um, a different line of reporting other than like day-to-day -day coverage of the ins and outs of the criminal justice system, the crime of the day and stuff like that, or the lawsuit of the day, the press conference of the day, just doing deeper dives. Um, and that kind of took me down the path of, um, it's what I wanted to do. And it took me deeper and deeper into the department's history and the incredible, um, I guess, dysfunction that we saw during that period. And Darwin and I met in about 2012, um, while we were both kind of reporting for the local alternative weekly newspaper in Oakland, the East Bay Express on different aspects of city government and power. And I basically like dra grabbed him by the neck and gra dragged him into reporting on policing because I saw that he was good and gave a different perspective and different lens onto things than I had. Yeah, I wasn't ever intending to become like a, a reporter who was had any expertise whatsoever on policing and criminal justice issues. I would in the mid 2000s, I was a graduate student at UC Santa Barbara and I was studying in the sociology department and I was um, also working as a teaching assistant in the Black Studies department there. And so my research and the professors who and grad students I had the, you know, really privilege of working with, we were all really focused on issues of like race and ra racial inequality, housing, um, uh, gender, identity, social movements, things like that. Um, and but, you know, by the time I graduated with my degree in 2010, there weren't any academic jobs. So I just started reporting. I just started doing journalism because it seemed like a, a, a good way to like pass the time and like pay my <laughs> pay my rent, basically, um, and like do something kind of meaningful with, you know, all the like knowledge that I had been able to glean from all these brilliant people I'd been around. Um, and yeah, I ran into Ali and we just started doing this reporting on policing. I eventually came to understand that policing is very integral to all those other problems, housing insecurity, poverty, inequality. Um, so it just made sense to just lean further into it over time. Thank you both. And Darwin, can you say a little bit more about your last, what you last said around policing being integral and intersectional to all of the issues that you were studying and were, were excited to get into in college, the Black studies, the racial injustice. Can you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. It's, and this is kind of a subtext that we wove um, in certain portions of our book. There's a few chapters where we try to, um, we don't, we don't fully come out and like give a, give an exposition of this, but like, um, you know, had, had we had like a few hundred more pages, we could have really gotten into it, but um, that was a fight that uh, we lost with our editor. Yeah, but, um, you know, policing is a function that, you know, it's been in existence for, you know, several hundred years. Um, modern policing, like, you know, really emerges, um, uh, you know, in the, in the late 1800s um, in England and the United States and other places. And it, the way it professionalizes and changes over time um, the, the story that it tells itself and that a lot of people understand about it is that policing came about as a way of like enforcing order in society and, you know, protecting the weak from the, the strong, as it were. And um, but but really, when you go back and look at it and, and you look at how policing functions, um, 
in in history uh you know it, it's the case that um policing today in america the function of it is to basically clean up the mess that's made by um the uh, the unleashing of the forces of capitalism and racism in society and so when you have a society that's so deeply riven by like class conflict and racial uh racial inequality um when you have such extreme poverty in society you're laying the foundation for the social phenomenon of crime and if you choose not to address crime by going back and making a more equal society and repairing the damage and the trauma that's been done to people by having them get thrown out of their houses and having their children not be able to attend good schools and having their lives be a complete wreck and you know their their work being something that immiserates them and destroys their bodies when you when you don't reform societies and make make them more egalitarian and like a good place for everyone to live you have crime and to deal with crime most societies that are extremely unequal have lots of police in order you know to to um enforce laws against all manner of things but generally property crimes and violence and and then you end up with huge prison systems to lock people up so i think that's kind of the the big picture connection lot you know lots more to say about that but it's it's hard to really get into um uh, all of it yeah thank you i appreciate that and i think i met i think i met you all around 2010 2011 and this social analysis that you're 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 exhibiting here um, and your willingness to take a systems lens to the day-to-day -day ins and outs and goings on at the Oakland Police Department in this city was really unique, right? I mean, I think that you all were really the first reporters in Oakland to take a deep dive and to do true investigative reporting and true investigative journalism into the Oakland Police Department and go beyond the headlines to really ask critical questions. And so after doing that, you know, for, for a number of years, how did you decide that writing a book about the Oakland Police Department was your next step? So that's, we've been kind of asked by different people, why don't you do this? Like in 2013, my old advisor, Lowell Bergman from Berkeley's Investigative Reporting Program said, why don't you write a book on OPD? You know, fun, we'll give you time and space for a year to do this. And I said, look at it what would I write on? I don't understand it yet. I don't understand why this place is the way it is. But when we would write our, why there's dysfunction, why this court oversight has gone on at that point for 10, 11 years, why the, there were, there was a period in 2013 when they went through, when the department went through with three police chiefs in a week. Um, that was really when the current situation where the court the federal judge's monitor essentially runs the police department and everything. Um, that's when that situation came to pass. And we, in our articles about this, even though we had the, um, the privilege of writing for an alt weekly and being able to do 1200, 3000, sometimes 5,000 word articles, um, explaining these kind of episodic scandals and like the push and pull the ebb and flow of the politics of, criminal justice and safety in Oakland and like these broader systemic issues like where do cops live where does the pay go what does the overtime payment look like who gets to make these decisions can this can the department actually solve homicides and violent crime what's happening in the meantime where is the actual breakdown happening because investigative reporting is it's systems analysis you look at a system you understand it to the point that you can basically say okay here's how it's supposed to function in theory and in practice is everything running right? You know, is the carburetor blown? Are the are the pistons firing off off sequence or stuff like that? And that's just a metaphor. That's a metaphor of trying to like explain how we as reporters go about our job. You pick apart things like the internal affairs process, criminal um, criminal investigative division process, um, the way that the command staff relates to each other. But in all our stories, we hit this point where we had to explain how the department got into a consent decree where the you know where the alleged corruption was where the not alleged where the real breakdown in the department's function was and it was always this passing reference to a scandal in 2000 um, contemporaneous to the rampart scandal in lapd that involved a group of officers who kidnapped um framed up tortured essentially um 
Black Oaklanders in pursuit of then Mayor Jerry Brown's um, Clean Up the Streets Zero Tolerance program uh, that was adapting an NYPD tactic from the 1990s to the streets of Oakland. And they were known as the Riders. That was a game name that they gave themselves. And we were getting kind of, you know, there was this period where we would get more and more frustrated at not being able to go into this back history for more than a paragraph or two. And I think sometime after the sexual exploitation scandal um, of 2016, 2017, both of us had it in our head, okay, we actually have enough scope. There's enough of an arc here. That there was a reform arc that kind of started with the, the consent decree and crashed. And then there was a second reform arc that began with um, the 2013 episode where three police chiefs were flushed out and the court took partial control. There was an attempt at writing the ship and that came crashing down afterwards. So there's enough in there for us to be able to hook the present to the back history of Oakland and pull back and examine the past. And the blueprint that we took for examining the past and examining the story of a city through a key institution like the police department um, was Mike Davis's City of Courts, a uh, dearly departed um, sociologist, tremendous, tremendous writer from Los Angeles who did the same thing with that city in 1990, right before the Rodney King riots. And it was, you know, prophetic is I think a understatement. So that's that's where our long-winded answer of saying that's where our um, our concept for coming together and saying okay now we actually have to put this thing together um, that's where it came from. And how how difficult was it to get the information that you needed to get to actually write the book? I mean, police are known for the thin blue wall of silence and closing rank. And so I'm really interested to, to understand how it is that you all, I mean, you had some detailed information in the book and you had some insider only knowledge in the book. I mean, a lot, a lot of information that you had um, came from public records and court records and things like that. But you also had, um, as I read it, you know, you had to have relationships or some deep informants uh, that you were working with in order to get that kind of backstory and insider information. And for all of those years, right? Because you took the police department through decades of, of story and information. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about just how difficult it was or how you went about getting the information to write the book? Yeah, I'll talk about the records and I guess you want to talk about the, yeah, we can do that. the sources. Um, so yeah, you know, police records are notoriously difficult for the public and, and the media to obtain. Um, under California state law, um, most police records are exempt from the Public Records Act because they're considered, there's a, there's a section of the, the actual um, California government code as codified by the Public Records Act, which says, you know, like, police law enforcement investigatory records are exempt from disclosure. You just don't have to give them to the media or the public. Um, and so it's extremely difficult to, um, to get records of like, um, you know, uh, uh, crime incident reports and things like that. Um, then there's a further layer of um, secrecy under the Police Officers Bill of Rights, which um, what you know came out of battles between police unions and um, civilian police oversight boards and reporters in the 70s and the 80s. Um, and there were some important cases um, all the way into the, the 2000s, which kind of shored up the protections that police officers had in their personnel records. And so, um, you know, any any investigation or examination of alleged police misconduct um, was uh completely secret until um quite recently it was e extremely rare that these records would ever come to light they were usually flushed out by someone in a department like leaking it or something all of that changed really significantly in 2019 when um senate bill 1421 which was authored by east bay um state senator nancy skinner um went into effect and that law had a profound impact on um, everything by making certain categories of police personnel records, including these internal affairs investigations and these 
use of force, uh, uh, review boards, and all, all these documents and methods that the police use to investigate themselves internally, suddenly um, officer-involved shootings, uses of force resulting in great bodily harm, any type of sexual misconduct, um, and any instance of a sustained dishonesty. So sustained sexual misconduct, um, including like sexual assault, harassment, things like that by a police officer, and a sustained instance of dishonesty. Sustained meaning the officers did these Sounds did good. these things, yeah. Um, so suddenly those records were available for the public to ask for. And in so theory. in theory. So we we asked for, so we knowing a lot about the Oakland Police Department, we put in like two over 30 requests saying individual requests for specific cases. Oh give us this stuff like you know just examples we there were lots of high profile officer involved shootings we asked for like all you know all sorts of stuff going back to the 90s um all the way up through 2019 and the city um sat on our request and didn't do anything with it um for you know well over i think a year so we got an attorney and our attorney filed a lawsuit against the city saying, hey, you've brazenly violated the Public Records Act. We had a hearing before a judge. The judge completely sided with us. Um, I think I literally jumped for joy in my apartment. Like, like not only did we win, we won huge. And so um, the city was forced to start handing this stuff over. And we started getting just like you know, these emails um, on, fr you know, usually like sometime, Friday night. yeah, Fridays and stuff through our attorney. And we would just have these huge batches of records um, for all of these cases. Of course, that meant we now had to read through like tens of thousands of pages of records and a lot of it very difficult reading, right? Because it's not, you know, this, a lot of these records are really tragic um, incidents about people's lives being ruined um members of the public also police officers who you know went through a lot of like pain and misfortune um but you know we had we had to read through all that stuff so you know shout out to nancy skinner and shout out to like all the legislators who um have re have have you know thought about like changing the laws regarding these records because there is a huge public interest yeah. in the public being able to know this stuff and like talk about it yeah and our attorney sam ferguson really uh, right, the city and the judge over the coals for this. Um, but we also had to do the work of not when we got the records, we ha also had to do the work of going through them. And, you know, many pages of them were completely blacked out. They were redacted and there'd be a, a number and a letter next to it, which is the exemption in the California Public Records Act the city was relying on. And in some cases, they wouldn't, they would do it in a way that didn't correspond. It didn't, um, like jive with what they've done with uh, with other similar files they redact like someone's name in one file and leave it open in another file or there would be tremendous portions of it redacted from one case that in another case the same format of document would have that narrative there so we also had to do this kind of really kafkaesque um exercise of going through the documents looking at these big black boxes of redactions and saying okay well here's what we think is behind them and this is why that exemption doesn't apply or here's where they're overextending or doing this automatically or by rote fashion there was that entire aspect and that actually was tremendously time consuming tedious very tedious yeah. but and you know we're not lawyers right yeah yeah so, you know what the records look like um well, but you all did an amazing job i can say that for sure um i think for for those listening in who don't know i was at the oakland police department i was a sworn officer from 2001 to 2015 had you know several roles but um including internal affairs investigator child exploitation investigator i was a public information officer that's when i met these guys and then i was the chief of staff so i was there for a significant block of time so in reading the book you know i was floored honestly and impressed by how accurate your telling of my experience and of you know some of the uh, very, you know, large scale scenarios that I've been a part of, including Occupy, including um, the protests for Oscar Grant, uh, including, you know, so there were there were significant events that happened and that you all like got it very, very right. And so I was impressed by that.
Um, I'm going to pivot to Ileana for just a moment, since y'all brought up the importance of policy and Nancy Skinner's efforts and um, you know the impacts of SB 1421 to really open up the, the, the city records and the police records to the public and to reporters. Uh, I'm gonna pivot to Ileana because she has been leading policy work for GLIDE, for the Center for Social Justice, centered on increasing equity and securing additional rights and protections for marginalized communities. And Ileana, some of your most current advocacy has focused specifically on police reform. So I would love for you to tell us a little bit about your work. Yes, um, thank you, Holly. And it's, it's great to hear um, already the framing with a more sociological or systemic analysis, which I definitely appreciate. Um, I have a sociology background as well. Um, so in terms of the work uh, that, that I've been doing uh, uh, that relates to policing and police reform, um, there, there are three, uh, three campaigns or issue areas that come to mind. Um, one is uh, our work in coalition to end bias stops, um, to end uh, racial profiling in uh, traffic stops in San Francisco. Um, and secondly, there's also a focus on addressing the criminalization and policing of drug use. And then lastly, the criminalization of uh, homelessness and people experiencing homelessness. So I can just provide a little bit of um, context for each of those campaigns. Um, so in our work uh, in the Coalition to End Bias Stops, we're, um, we're dealing with uh, traffic stops, which are actually the most common interaction Americans have with police. Um, and the way those stops work is that police have the power to choose who to stop as long as they spot even the, the smallest type of violation or infraction. Like it could even be an air freshener hanging from a rear view mirror that could be cause for an officer to pull someone over. Um, and that those types of traffic stops can become a pretext um, for officers to investigate a driver or passenger or even you know, stop a pedestrian or a bicyclist on a hunch that they might be engaged in further criminal activity, which is subject to explicit or implicit bias. Um, and that's where a lot of the con concern comes in. And we see this borne out in the data in San Francisco and, and, and in other jurisdictions. And we see this um, anecdotally through stories in the community and from our own clients. Um, for a bit of the data, um, Black San Franciscans make up about 5% of San Francisco population, but they account for 26% of stops and 36% of searches. And if you go back to 2018, um, the SFPD has stopped Black people at least six times the rate of white people. They've searched Black people at least 10 times the rate of white people. And they were at least 12 times more likely to use force on Black people compared to white people. Um, you know, and some people might say, well, maybe this is about, you know, actual criminal activity or the police, you know, trying to find contraband like um, guns or things like that in people's cars. But in fact, police stop and search Black and Latinx drivers on the basis of less evidence than white drivers. And even though white drivers are less likely to be searched, they're actually more likely to be found with contraband. So there really isn't a, a public safety uh, kind of logic or um, basis for, for this type of bias and harm that's being caused in the community. So through the Coalition to End Bias Stops, we have achieved initial passage of a policy to restrict the SFPD's ability to conduct these types of pretextual uh, stops that are disproportionately harming communities of color, causing, um, you know, trauma and often, you know, escalating to violence and as we've seen sometimes um, even death. So that's a major campaign that um, achieved that initial victory in January and is currently um, in a process called meet and confer where the police officers association um, gets to sort of hash out the, the policy in a sort of behind closed door manner, which we can talk more about later, or um, it's definitely a whole other issue, but um, it's in the process and hopefully there'll be a second vote where it, it passes. Um, and then just um, quickly, just on some of the other work, um, 
we definitely have a focus on uh, the criminalization and policing of drug use because at Glide, we advocate for a public health re response to what is a public health crisis. And criminalizing and further marginalizing and isolating people who use drugs does not prevent overdoses. It, in fact, increases overdoses. And further, disrupting the drug supply does not affect or end the demand for drugs, but it actually just increases the potency of drugs and the volatility of the drug market, which also causes more overdoses. So um, in our work, we advocate for overdose prevention centers, the increased distribution of naloxone, which is um, a way to, over to reverse overdoses, um, increased access to treatment, and um, a, a, a range of other evidence-based approaches um, to address this public health crisis. Um, and then just lastly, we, we see all the time the policing of homelessness and people experiencing homelessness, basically the criminalization of poverty. And um, that type of policing does not result in a connection to services for people experiencing homelessness. It just further creates harm um, for people's physical and mental health. And it actually perpetuates and prolongs homelessness by creating barriers to housing and services and jobs. Um, for example, if someone, if the police in concert with other city departments are clearing um, tents that people are living in or a place where someone's staying, they might lose access to important documents, um, ID, uh, medication, things like that, that actually prevent them from getting housing or getting a job and, and continuing on to try to um, access more stability. Um, it also exacerbates racial inequality, this type of policing of homelessness. We already see huge racial disparities among um, people experiencing homelessness. And then you combine that with the um, with the way that policing works, that's just going to further um, some of the uh, racial inequity that we see. So to counter um, the, the issues of policing and homelessness, we, we've engaged in a number of campaigns and, and tried a number of solutions, um, including trying to fight against the, the, these types of sweeps, which are so harmful, and increase shelter access, because actually during COVID, there's been um, no sort of voluntary self-referral uh, shelter access for people in San Francisco. They're most often able to get into shelter because they're swept um, by the police and other city departments. Um, so that's one area uh, we're also focused on, you know, preventing people from having their cars towed because sometimes they live in their cars or um, their, you know, their cars are obviously very important to uh, jobs and all sorts of other things which can prevent homelessness. And then lastly, we have been fighting for alternatives to policing when it comes to responding to people experiencing homelessness through a campaign called the um, Compassionate Alternative Response Team, or CART, um, which is an effort to have non-police uh, respond to certain types of 911 calls that are specifically rated, uh, related to people's housing status, like someone, um, maybe someone's blocking someone's driveway or they're in front of a certain area and someone calls. It could be a non-police peer uh, team response to try to take police out of situations that often escalate um, into more harm and sometimes violence. So that's just an overview. You're busy. <laughs> Thank you, Eliana. You bring up um, really important points about the policing of poverty, the war on drugs, traffic stops, search rate versus recovery rate. And that really brings me to my next question for Darwin and Ali. Uh, the book starts with and largely centers the case of the Oakland Riders, who you briefly mentioned. Um, they were a group of Oakland police officers accused of significant corruption and civil rights violations, including racial profiling and planting drugs, um, brutality, kidnapping, falsifying of official documents, and all the Although the writer's case shone a bright light on issues of police abuse in Oakland, resulting in a criminal trial, civil rights lawsuits, and this ongoing federal court oversight of the police department, you argue in the book that OPD's brutality and corruption started long before 2000. Can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, I mean, it's our attempt to explain um, how that particular group of officers felt that it was appropriate or their job to go out and police in this fashion. We had to explain that they're not individuals that, you know, spring forth fully formed um, the day that they decide to put on a badge um, and start patrolling the streets. They're shaped by their colleagues. They're shaped by the department's internal culture. They're shaped by the way, the, by like the pathways, the transmission, the transmission of knowledge from one generation of officer to the others that doesn't really happen. Like this all happens way below the level of chief. This happens at the sergeant level. This happens at the level of the field training officer who goes at, who's the person responsible for young officers during their first six, was it six months, year on the job when um, they're fresh out of the academy and learning how to police. Um, and in order to understand that, we had to basically go, we wanted to go back and unpack what the police department was at its core. Um, and so we started with like the basic history of Oakland going back to the mid 19th century and explaining how the police department had kind of two core missions um, up until the mid 20th century when like violent crime suppression becomes kind of the raison d'etre of law enforcement. And until then, um, Oakland was a town like most other California cities that was built on natural resource extraction. So there was a big subordinate, there was a big like working class of Chinese migrants. And that was the kind of subordinate class that the ruling Anglo hills that lived in West Oakland at first, and then the, then the hills, um, once they were developed, wanted to keep in line and wanted to suppress. So the cops were around, the police department existed to basically suppress, the, to keep the Chinese in line and any other like rowdy, um, disobedient, like subaltern group later on, it would be labor radicals, Southern and Central European migrants. Um, after the Second World War, it would be African-American migrants who came up to um, the Bay Area and settled um, for work in the war industries. Uh, and the other thing was to basically protect the private property of the city's elite. And we had to kind of go back and arc, pull out the newspaper archives and the city's um, own records of its history, find oral histories, um, dissertations, books, good journalism that had that history. Um, so we were able, luckily, as we were kind of advanced through the 20th century and were able to kind of unpack the history, not just of the department's brutal suppression of, um, you know, the radical community and the African-American Chinese community and the African-American community, we were also able to unearth the stories of resistance to this. And that um, starts very early in Oakland. It's one of the reasons why it's an edge case in the country, because not only is the oversight here now going on for longer than anywhere else, it's been going on because the pushback to, you know, unconstitutional jackbooted law enforcement has been going on since the 1940s, right? Um, the first state investigation into a police department for um, its just egregious treatment of Black residents happened in 1950. The state legislature convened a hearing here, um, I believe, at the Renee C. Davidson Courthouse, right? Um, then, you know, the Black Panther Party started up in the mid-1960s as a result of very sustained youth agitation that kind of came out of a um, broader cultural foment at the time, but it was directly aimed at oppressive law enforcement, the police as an occupying army, as a colonizing army. That was the frame that the Panthers put, the really important conceptual frame that they put on law enforcement. And their intent was to kind of police the police with guns and document what they did in the community. Um, so when we got a little bit further towards the present day, we were able to speak with some people who were still had been around during that era and get their accounts of history, not just people who lived in Oakland, but also former officers. Um, you mentioned that a little bit earlier. We were actually really, um, really in the debt of many, many, many people who worked in the department who spoke to us about what they saw very frankly, um, quite a lot of whom were from Oakland, which is a rarity in the Oakland Police Department. Maybe about, what is it, 10% of the department on average is from, actually from Oakland. Even though there are these families that have generational links to OPD, um, they tend to be from outside, from the suburbs over the hills and to the north. Um, but these people really were very candid and laid out the kind of what they saw, um, black, white, Asian, Latino, like 
all backgrounds. And it was really, um, being able to trace out that history was really important because you can't understand, you can't begin to understand what it's like to grow up in a paramilitary culture, to kind of grow up as a professional um, without understanding how those, um, those mannerisms, those behaviors, those expectations are passed down by generations of officers and the ways in which the kind of formalized training that you receive in the academy looks nothing like the, the training that you receive while you're in the squad car during your probationary period with your FTO. Thank you. You bring up a really important point. I think that is that not everyone within police departments and definitely within a police department as diverse as the Oakland Police Department, it's, it's not a monolith, right? It's not, all officers are not rowing in the same direction. And I think that during my time at the Oakland Police Department, was definitely like an internal culture wars that were also happening. But at the same time, the narrative of the bad seeds also doesn't fit, right? This, this narrative that every time um, we have a, a, another officer involved shooting or um, an excessive force case or a scandal, um, you know, the police department in the cities seem to um, want to sell us on the bad seeds narrative that, you know, we've isolated this one particular officer or this small group of officers and, you know, we've cut them off or we fired them or we've punished them and now everything's okay and the rest of the team is great, <laughs> right? So, I mean, can you talk to us a little bit about um, those two realities that, you know, the police department, the Oakland Police Department is not a monolith and there are some cultural wars that go on inside of the police department um, with kind of old guard versus new guard. Um, reform-minded versus the good old boys. And at the same time, the, uh, you know, the, the bad apple narrative is, is not complete enough. Yeah, police departments are like any other institution, right? Um, any big institution, they're, they're really complicated and they're, yeah, there's different factions. There's um, certainly you you can say that there is a like culture to policing in America or a dominant culture to policing in America that um, exerts itself in any police department. And so the dominant culture in the Oakland Police Department for many decades was one that was shaped by the fact that the overwhelming number of officers were men. Um, the uh, Many of them were white men. Um, many of them had conservative politics. Uh, many of them did not have significant uh, deep ties to Oakland, and they viewed their job as, you know, coming in to, like, um, you know, restore order in the streets of the city that they viewed as just being, you know, chaotic and, and so forth. And uh, within that dominant culture in the department, some of the most popular officers were the ones who were, in fact, uh, the most violent and also somewhat corrupt, uh, willing to blur the lines to make arrests, to, to make felony arrests and get people incarcerated. Um, but within the Oakland Police, even within the Oakland Police Department during those eras in the, in the 50s, and especially in the 60s, especially in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, um, as the department started hiring more people from Oakland, um, more black officers in particular, and especially also more officers who were women or who were not like, you know, um, who were LGBTQ, who had some other identity, right? Th those, those officers started to like form affinity groups. And in fact, you know, some of the, um, some of the officers in the department, you know, formed the Oakland Black Officers Association. Um, there was a, a Oakland Latino Officers Association. And these, these organizations could push back internally around what they viewed as you know, racism within the department, um, and also to speak out for uh, portions of the Oakland community that they felt were getting like a raw deal at times. Mm -hmm. um, so internally, yeah, a lot of definitely a lot of pushback over the years, and you know, um, but but the 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 dominant culture of policing, it's really hard to displace it. And it, it remains in, in a lot of departments in the United States and arguably still within the Oakland Police Department, there's like this culture of, you know, um, you're a good cop if you're aggressive, hard charging, physical, and there's this sense of like, 
it's important to be popular and to be liked. And there's a culture of teasing and joking, which borders on harassment a lot of time. So it's very difficult um, to, to displace that culture for a lot of reasons, because it's like any other institution, Cha transforming it, changing it is not as simple as just coming in and rewriting policies. You really have to take things apart and rebuild them. Absolutely. I, I always say, you know, that that culture eats policy for breakfast, right? And so it's like, how do you pull multiple systems change leverage points at once? And one of the leverage points that I think we often forget about in our in our systems change and social justice work is narrative change work, right? And, and that's, you know, for me, the importance of the book is really thinking through the fact that whoever defines the problem gets to define the solution, you know, and, and, and the strategies and the investments. And so um, recently um, the governor and Rob Bonta came to the Tenderloin in San Francisco and, you know, made obviously the, the observations that we're all making every day, walking around and coming in and out of Glide. Um, that fentanyl is, is a is a problem and that people are not feeling safe in the tenderloin. Um, so the solution is that they're sending in the California National Guard and the California Highway Patrol. And it just feels like we've been here so many times before, right? With um, a policing and punitive response to public health crisis and um, to poverty, to, to the drug drug trade and drug use. So I'm just wondering from, from you, Darwin, and uh, Ali, and you, Eliana, if you have any, any insights or comments just uh, about that, about what we have happening here with the narrative change issue and strategies and investments that have shown um, over the years to, to not only not work, not they don't keep anyone safer or create any additional safety, but actually further destabilize already marginalized communities? Well, I would say that, so there's a huge problem with overdoses, with fentanyl overdoses back east. That's been, I think, predates that wave hit the east coast, maybe about five years before, six years before um, it really, fentanyl really started rippling out in San Francisco's drug supply. I remember actually noticing the first like uptick in overdose deaths in San Francisco, people started to say, oh, well, it's, you know, these are, this is, these are populations that don't normally use black, black tar heroin or stuff like that. They're using cocaine and they're overdosing with that. And in my mind, I was like, okay, you all have fentanyl in your drugs. Is it going to be everywhere in three months, five months, a year? Um, and the timeline kind of bore out. But the thing about the overdose deaths, fentanyl is, a, it's harder to reverse the, uh, a fentanyl overdose with Narcan than it is heroin, but you can do it, right? You can do it if people are in a situation where they're using a that type of drug and somebody has access to Narcan in a cabinet where they're in a setting where they're being monitored and somebody can notice if they're breathing shallow if they stop breathing and then they can try and revive them. Again, people who are using these drugs, they have a substance abuse problem with it. They have an addiction that needs to be treated like an act, like an illness. And when you push them kind of, you keep doing these homeless sweeps that when you push people further and further and further out into, you know, underneath freeways or into viaducts or stuff like that, um, you're just putting them further and further away from places where they can get help. And realistically, they do need the help. And it costs us no matter what as a society, those sweeps cost tons of money, tons of money. And they just lead to more sweeps. It's like a waterbed or whack-a-mole, you know? It's like you're trying to, you know, grab a an oil spill in your hand you try to pick up oil and water it just slips right out between your fingers so um it's performative i think a lot of the national guard stuff for me um is very reminiscent of like 1980s 1990s politics where you know you send the battering ram into the into the drug den with all the cameras outside um look we're doing something about it but what you're doing is actually not much and the drug supply is coming from, from, you know, multinational drug trafficking organizations that are very good at what they do and they have a market here. The problem is the consumption of it. It's not the fact that it gets here, it's the demand. Definitely, and, and the policing and 
the fear just further isolates people, which is the one of the most dangerous things when it comes to drug use and prevention of overdose when people are using alone. Um, so that's why it's so much more important to focus on actual solutions like overdose prevention centers where people can use in a safe environment where um, you know, people are around to supervise and reverse any overdoses. And there's also an even more basic option, which is the distribution of naloxone or Narcan to um, organizations like, like Glide that has a harm reduction program or other organizations across the state that distribute naloxone. And um, even though those organizations received less of the, the overall uh, quantity of naloxone distributed by the state, they were still responsible for, I think it's two thirds of the um, documented overdose reversals because it's there's a lot of evidence that putting naloxone or Narcan in the hands of people who use drugs and people who love and support and are, and are nearby to people who use drugs is the most effective way to prevent overdose. And right now there's actually a shortage of accessing naloxone for a lot of these organizations. Um, and there's um, an effort to extend and expand funding at the state level to have more uh, support for organizations and programs that, that provide naloxone and other um, harm reduction services to prevent the spread of illness and prevent overdose. And we should be focusing on those solutions if we're actually concerned about um, um, overdose. And then there's also obviously many treatment uh, resources that need to be provided that are not being provided and a broader, to, to zoom out, a broader context of housing, in some su income support, um, addressing massive wealth inequality, all of these things obviously as well. But even if you're just focused on um, drugs and overdose, there are proven solutions that are way more effective at preventing overdose if that's what we're actually concerned about. And when it comes to the policing response, um, it, it's it's hard to uh, it's hard to not think that it's a disingenuous concern for overdose that's driving um, the current response. Yeah, I think yeah. it's really concerning what what's happening. Um, yeah. Personally, I think the reason that people use drugs like fentanyl. Um, is because they've been through something very traumatic in their lives and they're, you know, I think addiction is born of a need to treat that trauma, um, that spiritual um, wound that people have. And I think um, addiction is also a medical issue. It's in the body and it needs to be treated as such. And, you know, there is not a single thing the National Guard can do to address the spiritual problem of, of people taking, you know, people abusing their own health with drugs. And the police are not doctors. They're not positioned to treat the medical problem of addiction. The So what's going on in San Francisco right now, just, just sort of like a more... Um, distilled version of our like national drug policy, which, you know, mainly focuses law enforcement on problems. And it's just really unfortunate and it's not going to go anywhere. It's, it's performative. It's theater. It's reaction to media attention too. I mean, San Francisco time and time and time again is the focus of anything that the hard right media, and I, I, I think there's no real qualm in calling certain forms of media hard right. They will lock on to San Francisco and magnify small problems there into massive, you know, societal problems. Um, and that's one reason why I think there's such a counter reaction. And it's a little bit alarming to see Newsom and Ponte go in that direction. Yeah, it's the the swinging, right? It's it's the swings back and forth, and it seems like we were uh, moving in one direction, and we were thinking about the issue as a public health issue. Uh, and now we're swinging back into a, a tough on crime narrative and a tough on crime response. And um, so, you know, speaking of those those swings, uh, in the book, you all really talk about a period from about 2012 to 2015, where the Oakland Police Department seemed to be headed in the direction of true reform, right? Uh, they were swinging in, in the right direction. They had a reform-minded police chief who'd largely built his career holding officers accountable. They'd implemented new use of force policies and trainings. They'd equipped officers with body-worn cameras, focused on racial profiling and stop data collection, and implicit bias training as well. Uh, I think the implicit bias training at that time was the, 
the um, first in the country. And they brought in Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt from Stanford University to support with implicit bias training and the collection of implicit bias data. So, you know, at that time, some of the police department's practices even made their way into the Obama administration's seminal report, you know, the report and recommendations on 21st century policing. So from all of that progress or seeming progress, what happened? Talk to us about what went wrong. Why are we still here in 2023 with an unfinished consent decree, police chiefs being terminated, scandals, officers being charged? We're, we're swinging back. So talk to us about that. Well, I know, I know I'm reading Ali's mind right now, and, <laughs> and I know he wants to talk about why and what the problem is currently, but so, so I'll just say really quickly, that progress was real, and actually a lot of that progress is, is still visible on the streets of Oakland right now. Um, so, you know, the, the work that Eliana was talking about earlier, the campaigns that, that she's working on, um, those are so crucial. And part of the reason we know this is because like Oakland, for example, did a lot of hard work eliminating pretextual traffic stops and other kinds of stops and preventing officers from searching people based purely on, you know, so having a hunch or yeah, the, the city of Oakland doesn't even allow its officers to do, um, you know, just a probation parole, um, stop search anymore. Um, and so those policies actually, um, the data that the, the Oakland police stop data shows that the police department stops an, an enormously lower percentage now of African-American people than it used to. And it's just proof that you actually can prevent racial profiling. Now, do, is racial profiling still going on in Oakland with the, with the police department? Probably. And I think a lot of a lot of people in the black community here will say it is. Um, but there are other ways you can measure this. Um, the Oakland Police Department used to get, you know, 10, even upwards of 14, 15 officer-involved shootings in a single year. And, and some of those police shootings were actually of people who were unarmed. Very problematic stuff. Um, nowadays, there might be one, two, three police shootings in a year. I know it's a weird metric, but it does matter that, you know, 10, 12 or more people aren't being shot by the police, aren't being, you know, tased or other, um, you know, deadly use of forces occurring against them. And it especially matters to certain communities for whom that sort of um, force has been focused on for a long time. So the progress that happened during those years was real, and some of it is still sticking to this day. So I just want to say that because I think the, the campaigns that um, you all are working on in San Francisco are extremely important because that, you know, if you can achieve those things, the, the gains are observable and real. Yeah, and there are gains, the studies that we're talking about, the Stop Data study, um, Jennifer Eberhardt and OPD conducted that first study of theirs in, what, 2014? That was the first similar study for that. And um, it was groundbreaking at the time and really kind of changed, you're talking about narrative change. That was a tremendous moment because it's a hard data point with the police department's own data and their practice saying, okay, well, this actually leads to, it hurts our relationships with certain components of the community. And maybe it's not the best use of our time since we're not actually picking up narcotics, contraband, weapons during these stops. They're not good uses of our time. So how can we do this better? Um, so what happened that reversed that progress? So during this period of time, there was also a lot of progress happening with investigations of violent crime, gun crime in Oakland too. The violent crime rate, the homicide rate, the shooting rate dropped very sharply after uh, the city pivoted to a very um, narrowly focused strategy, figuring out who is shooting at who, who is committing the majority of robberies, who's committing the majority of homicides, and how there were certain groups, small number of people, same thing as officers who commit misconduct, small number of people commit outsized um, numbers of violent crimes. And once those people were focused down on, there was an attempt to try and either divert them into social service programs or to focus on them for racketeering and conspiracy cases with the assistance of the state AG and the federal government. Um, and that had some success in terms of the overall violent crime approach. In terms of what fell apart with regard to the reform program, it really had to do with 
you know, the department was being very aggressive in terms of courting um, media attention. Um, it was the mayor and the police chief at the time were very much committed to the narrative that they were doing, committing, they were engaged in real lasting change that they were going to finish with the consent decree. There was an idea, the consent decree was conceived of as something that they need to complete and be done with, as opposed to being a technical document that was meant to in play, was meant to put in place lasting change, fundamental change to the institution, the sort that we spoke about of earlier. And when in 20, I believe 2015, um, the news of an all young uh, police officer's uh, wife, her suspicious death or suicide, allegedly in um, a house that he rented up in the hills, um, broke out. That um, homicide was not investigated properly per the department's own personnel, per the homicide investigator who was assigned to that. Um, There's a suspicion that she had been killed. They'd been having marital problems. Um, that didn't get looked into properly. Um, I think there was, a pro there was a fear that maybe this might have caused problems with the department's compliance with its reform program. It would have been bad press. Year goes by, that same officer then kills himself, leaves a suicide note um, in that same apartment that unravels the entire sexual exploitation scandal of 2016. Um, and that came to the attention, that came out in public. First, it came, that started, um, that came to the attention of the court. Um, the court then files a motion taking stripping the internal affairs investigation away from the police department, which we'd never seen before in like, at that point, almost 10 years of reporting on OPD, like week in, week out. So bottom line is that the police chief at the time, Sean went, was so obsessed with this idea that they were going to finish the consent decree and be done with it and just treat it as something that needed to be put aside. And then we can get back to doing what we need to do as an organization to policing our way and we need control back. Um, that he ended up basically covering up a massive, massive, massive scandal um, that not only shed light on a potential murder of an officer's wife and the sexual, sexual exploitation of an underage sex worker by several, if not dozens of police officers from dozens, several police officers from Oakland, dozens of police officers from around the Bay Area, many departments um, from San Francisco as far out as like Stockton. But what really happened is that there was an obsession with image that papered over some very real problems. Like a lot of the officers in Oakland who had um, been involved in this, this scandal, they were young officers who were hired quickly in the early 2010s to staff up the police department per the political requirements of the mayors of the time and the city councils. So there's this way in which the reforms actually didn't last, they didn't stick. They were treated as kind of a checklist. And that's where the problem came in with 2016. The next police chief after that, Ann Kirkpatrick, decides to make nice with the police union. The same sort of back and forth happened there. Consent decree, um, she got into over open conflict with the federal judge, and you just don't win those battles. And that's what happened with the last police chief, too. Like, you can't fight with the federal judiciary. When you enter into a consent decree, when you're in this binding agreement, you can make all the political noise you want. But if, the if you're fighting with the federal judge over this, I mean, they really do hold all the cards. One other thing to say about the unraveling of all that progress in 2016 was that um, the Oakland Police Department and a lot of police departments have done have done work around addressing um, the racism that is uh, deeply structured into policing um, and the violence of policing, particularly violence visited upon communities of color. There's been a lot of work done about that. The 2016 scandal had everything to do with gender-based violence and ex sexual exploitation. Um, and policing in America and the Oakland Police Department have never really done the work of addressing the violence that's done toward women and girls and um, uh, you know, LGBTQ communities, um, it, and policing still has a reckoning to go there. Yeah. Um, that's what a lot of the 2016 scandal was really about. 
Um, and so it actually wasn't surprising that that could derail all this other progress that had been made on these other fronts. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was actually afraid to ask you all that question about, um, you know, whether whether the progress of 2012 to 2015 was real or not, <laughs> because, you know, I was a part of the executive team during those years um, that was ushering in all of those changes. And so I often reflect on whether or not what we were able to accomplish during those years meant anything. So I was afraid to ask you the question. Um, but I, I appreciate you, you know, pointing out that that progress was real, that some of it still stands and is influencing outcomes for marginalized communities in Oakland. And again, going back to my original point about the accuracy and depth of your reporting, um, your analysis on what went wrong is mirrors my lived experience inside of the inside of that administration. You know, I went into, I, I left the child exploitation unit where I was focused on trafficking and gender-based violence for years to be a part of Sean Wentz's administration because he was had been for so many years in his career a reform-minded police chief that was not popular with the rank and file because he had done so much accountability work, um, you know, down to firing officers. And he was not concerned with popularity or um, being a part of the rank and file and was really focused on changing the police department. And I went up for that, for that reason. And we had a really good run for three years. And I think that what you all are lifting of that, that the taste of success and the taste of fame, really. I, I mean, I don't know how else to say it. We were being invited to the White House. We had national reporters calling us every other day. We had Pete Nix doing a story, right? Doing, doing a documentary, um, The Force, on our progress and how we were turning the police department around. I think there was a national story. The title, I can't remember at this point, but I remember something like how a dirty police department gets clean or something, right? So I think that that taste of fame and wins created some loss of humility and took away um, the drive to be living in inquiry and to keep asking the tough questions that we had been asking. And mm -hmm. it was just now about, we, we're so on fire, we need to be completed and done with this. So instead of reform and the deep dives that we started with, the team really started to focus on by any means necessary, needing to get out of the consent decree. And that really was concerning for me. And as you know, I, I resigned in September 2015 for these exact reasons. And then nine months later, this Celeste Guap scandal happened. Um, so I wonder, you know, with all of these complexities and the swings from, from um, you know, reform to scandal, uh, from public interest and, you know, defund the police to, you know, where we are now. You know, your reporting focuses on the Oakland Police Department. The book serves as a case study on American policing and specifically the complexities and challenges involved with police reform. But considering where we are now as a country, what are the most important insights for us to take away? You can't fix policing by focusing on policing. You've got to fix the, the broader problems in society in order to make it so that we don't need to rely on the police so much for security and safety. Um, that would be like one kind of big takeaway because, you know, without doing that, we're relying on the police to address all of these social problems that really we, we shouldn't be asking them to, you know, to be responding to. Um, I would say that's one big step back uh, thing to reflect on. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think that, you know, the, because, and I alluded to this at the beginning of the, uh, of our, of our session that, you know, every, so many other aspects of the state have been rolled back on like the educational system, um, housing, supportive housing, public health care, what it, it exists at all in this country, um, mental, you know, treatment for mental illness, uh, when you have one institution that's a, that's a suppressive institution, that is an armed institution, it's a paramilitary institution, 
that's geared up toward to deal with all these various different symptoms of deeper problems, it's going to end in tragedy, right? It cannot end well um, if that's what they have to deal with. And, you know, we're also, we are also like the most armed society in the world too. There's just a see, you know, there's a massive proliferation of firearms throughout the country. And that's something that we all have to live with. But I do think that in terms of the idea about what to do about law enforcement, like the idea of thinking of a consent decree is something that needs to be dealt with and go away and score a political point. You can't think about it like that. Maybe it should never go away. Maybe the best things that have happened in the Oakland Police Department, honestly, the study of racial profiling, the banning of public strip searches by police officers, which was a common thing up until the early 2010s, um, the restrictions on wanton use of less lethal munitions against peaceful protesters and respect for the First Amendment, um, the policy, the overhaul of the officer-involved shooting policy, um, and the reason why officer-involved shootings have decreased so much is because of overhauls to the chase policy and what sort of restrictions are placed on officers in terms of how they can engage in pursuit, when they need to break off, when they need to contain, when they need to have a respect for life and make sure that no bystanders are harmed. Those are changes that all came about, not because the police department said, okay, we have a problem, we need to fix them. They came about because of back and forth that happened in the context of the consent decree of this federal oversight um, from an outside from an outside party that in the form of the two plaintiff's attorneys, um, Jim Shannon and John Burris, um, who are not part of the Department of Justice. They're not part of the state of California. They're not part of an, a governmental administration. They're not appointees. They're independent from that system. And in some ways, that's a reason why the accountability and the changes have come about because they, you know, the, the issues that have come up, the real problems that have come up won't go away. So no one's going to avoid the consent decree in the same way that, for instance, Los Angeles Police Department was placed under a consent decree in 2000, around the exact same time as the rioters um, scandal cropped up and the consent decree came about. That was a uh, DOJ consent decree imposed by the federal government. That decree, when it was repealed in, I think, 2012 or 2013, there was a massive outcry from the legal community. Um, the current dean of um, UC Berkeley School of Law, Erwin Chemerinsky, wrote a very impassioned letter saying, same problems are here. They racially profile. They engage in excessive uses of force. They stop people for offenses that they don't commit. They, can, they commit warrantless searches of people based on race and probation and you know legal status. And the same problems will crop back up. The consent decree is voided within three to four years. The department is being accused of falsifying gang data for, you know, for statistics to please their superiors. They're being accused of massive instances of stop and, stop and frisk. Officer involved shootings go back up. Cops are being charged federally with selling firearms illegally to the black market. Like the, that form of outside oversight Maybe every police department should have it. Maybe every major police department should have it because they cannot police themselves. You do need outside oversight with teeth, with subpoena power, perhaps with the power to charge criminally. And, you know, we ostensibly have that in the form of the state attorney general, but this is a state of 40 million people. How can one office do that for essentially for the fourth biggest economy in the world? Absolutely. Absolutely. Y'all make a really strong case for resident um being residents being deeply involved in in policing and i think it's very clear or it should be um after reading your book but even after us living through all of the video footage that we've had to see on the news time and time again that the days of us just relying on the police and the government to do the right thing and us just enjoying the privileges of living in this country without being engaged citizens and without being a citizen watchdogs and without being involved in the democratic processes and demanding change and demanding policy reforms and um, demanding the investments that we know are going to keep our communities safe and um, just those days are over like it's you know very clear the police department made changes when citizens were heavily involved in the police department and police departments lose traction and revert when that oversight um, is let up on. Absolutely. So I am going to switch us to a couple of 
We have a couple of questions in the chat and we have a few minutes to address some of these. So I think Hannah asked how the Oakland Police Department changed in the last 10 years. I think you all addressed that. Michael Goldstein is asking, my police officer relative says every officer he knows would get out of policing if they had an alternate opportunity with the compensation they need. That's a tough order. <laughs> Cops get paid a lot in the Bay Area. I keep thinking skilled tacticians among police reformers could find allies within police departments for at least farming out functions that others are better suited to perform, maybe even for changing use of force protocols. So he's interested in what we have to think about that. I think some of this has happened, right? I mean, I think like the Oakland's um, task force that happened a year and a half ago was really looking at what functions um, other either city agencies or community-based organizations could provide. But, but do you all have anything to add just about the farming out of the police functions to others who are better suited to perform? Yeah, Oakland has a program called Macro. It's really well-funded. Um, they've got a couple teams of civilians that are unarmed. They have resources. Um, you know, they carry around like opioid overdose reversal drugs. They, um, they have like food and hygiene kits and they just cruise around Oakland trying to help people. And they, they do respond to calls for services that are like non-violent emergencies. Um, and that program has been pretty successful so far. And it's based off a program that got launched originally, I think in Eugene, Oregon. And that model is spreading to a lot of cities. And I think I heard earlier that San Francisco is doing something similar. Um, Oakland, I mean, another, here's an obscure example. Oakland just recently took away abandoned vehicle abatement from the Oakland Police Department. Um, do we really need police officers who are paid a ton of money um, spending their time towing abandoned cars? Probably not. Um, so now it's done by civilians in the Department of Transportation. Um, Oakland also um, no longer has police go out and um, uh, enforce laws around um, nuisance animals, which there are a lot of dogs in Oakland that, um, there's a lot of pit bulls in Oakland, basically, and they, there's a lot of calls about aggressive dogs in Oakland. And um, there's actually a famous example of a very tragic um, situation in which two officers um, in the early 90s went to... Um, take a young man's dog away from him. And it resulted in a shooting in which um, the young man shot uh, one of the officers. Um, the officers fired back, killed the young man and killed his father. Um, and actually the, uh, the, the woman whose son and, and husband were killed ended up becoming a very well-known police accountability activist in Oakland. But that whole situation may have never even needed to happen if um, you know, armed police officers hadn't been sent to, um, you know, confiscate someone's dog to put it to sleep. And instead, a civilian with a different toolkit went to address that problem. So those kind of things are all underway. Oakland had a whole reimagining public safety task force, as did other cities, where they were thinking about these ways to, like, spin out um, these different police functions. Um, just really quickly um, on the on the topic of, you know, police officer relatives, as every police officer um, they know would get out of policing if they could have alternate opportunities. I think that's true um, for some people. But, you know, there is something about policing as a profession as again, it's the um, one of the one of the dominant cultures within policing that rewards this kind of macho, aggressive attitude and approach to the world. There are people who are attracted to the profession because they feel like it's a way for them to go out and beat people up and do physical things. And um, and and you know, there is a small number of officers um, are the ones who generate a majority of the use of force complaints and a lot of the other complaints. And I don't think those officers would leave the force, even you know, if they had alternate opportunities elsewhere. Um, then that that sort of set of um, uh, problem officers are the ones who have like an oversized influence on a lot of the culture uh, within departments. Yeah, I would just second. I, only thing I have to say to that is I rode by the macro folks today in Paul High Street, um, at talking with somebody, looked like they were handing food or something like that. It's it's a big way in which. Um, Oakland has really kind of moved in one direction. The only other thing I would say is that police, you know, when you talk about this stuff, about 
shifting different functions away from the police department, you also have to realize that police departments are political entities in their own sense. And they're, this does involve taking money away from their slice of the municipal pie. Um, so, you know, you will run into situations where they'll fight that or fight to keep these programs within the police department and keep the funds coming to the police department. Um, you know, and officers who are in the situation where they'll work overtime in order to do these additional tasks, they make tons of money. I mean, there are cops in Oakland who make half a million dollars on their compensation. A lot of it's overtime. Thank you. And I see Michael has updated his question. I, I appreciate what APTP and others accomplished with MACRO, but what I'm wondering is whether people seeking those and other reforms can recruit allies from within the police department. I think that some of that was done. I remember when the task force in Oakland was first being put together, I had already left the police department, but multiple members had reached out to me to go over the list of suggestions that they were going to have for calls that could be taken away from the police department. And of course, I gave my opinion, but at that point, I'd been out of policing for several years and um, directed them to a few other officers within the police department that I knew were, would be allies. Um, so I don't know if you all have anything to add to that, but I think that that did, did occur and, and does occur. I think, you, I think you put it quite well. All right. Ileana, are we leaving anything out? Um, I would just, just to clarify the San Francisco to context, um, the Compassion Alternative Response Team, or CAR, is still very much um, a dream and not a fully realized reality um, because of a lot of um, complicated politics and city bureaucracy. Um, so that program has, has rose up actually because of a police commission resolution to try to um, shift responsibilities away from the police and involved a, a you know vast community effort to get that off the ground and it still isn't um, fully realized, um, especially in the way that a lot of the original community um, involvement uh, participants would have liked. But there's also been other efforts um, that have been a, a bit less from the community grassroots efforts um, to try to get more teams on the street uh, to deal with other issues that maybe the police would have responded to. Um, but as, as was mentioned, um, there is a political and um, budget component to these efforts that often um, creates more complication, even if an officer might not want to respond to a certain type of call. Um, if that, if, if part of what's going on is shifting resources away, um, then there can be pushback. And police departments are often getting so much more money than any of the other alternative um, options that are out there. So to ramp up those options, often would involve a shifting of funds, that then there is some pushback or sometimes significant pushback. It's too bad the governor and the attorney general aren't swooping in to support CART and getting that program off the ground quickly, you know? Yeah. Yes. So this is gonna lead me to our last question and it is coming in from Bright Star. Hey, Bright Star, shout out to Bright Star and Peter Kim who are doing a lot of criminal justice reform work from Bright Research Group in Oakland. And so her question is, has any police department effectively addressed the anti-reform efforts of police unions? As you all are talking about the pushback that happens at the political level, police unions have a lot of political power as we know. So Bright Star is asking, you know, are there any lessons from your investigative reporting on this particular barrier? I would say that it doesn't really come, so the examples I've seen of dealing with that pushback happen, um, have really happened on a statewide level. In, from about 2015-16 to the present, the California State Assembly and Senate passed a tremendous number of bills that really changed some of the most punitive and draconian elements of the state's criminal justice system, which at one point led to almost 200,000 Californians being incarcerated in CDCR and the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. And when they did that, they chopped the R off 
the acronym and it was just the California Department of Corrections because people could not be rehabilitated, right? That was the mentality. Um, there really has been an effort um, driven by lawsuits, driven by tremendous groundswell of activism over the 1990s and 2000s and 2010s to overhaul the state's criminal justice system. And that was achieved in spite of the vociferous opposition of the prison guard union and the police unions and the DA's unions. And they all lobby together in California. It's a massive lobby. So I just want to put it out there that you can achieve meaningful reform on a large scale in a place as influential as California with intelligent coalition building, really, you know, fearless legislators too, legislators who take this, these issues seriously. Shirley Weber um, was a tremendous force for good in the state uh, capital. But on a departmental level, it is really difficult to do because the police unions well, they may not, you know, the unions represent essentially the rank and file, not necessarily the supervisors. They don't have unanimous support within the departments, but they have allies in the media. They have allies in the business sector. They have people who know how to make noise in the right ways to shape narrative. And the hardest thing to do is to prize that them apart from the politicians in city hall or on a county level and make those lasting changes. Now, I think that in California, there are actually examples of such egregious harm by the old guard in certain departments. Oakland is a great example of that. SF, I think you're kind of getting there, but the problem with San Francisco has to do with the way that the city's demographics have actually gotten more conservative and more reactionary over the past 10 years. Um, and I, I think the voting patterns show that. Um, Los Angeles, though, the L.A. Sheriff's Department, which is one of the most powerful police law enforcement agencies in the state, let alone country, it's massive, it has a ton of political influence, it has capital. The county supervisors are basically, basically gotten to, you know, uh, because of a number of different federal investigations, state investigations, lawsuits, brawls that they had with the prior sheriff, Alex Villanueva. Um, they have been kind of in a pitch battle with the police union, with the sheriff's union. Um, and there's kind of a broader recognition that maybe there should be more oversight over law enforcement. And maybe the police unions themselves are part of the problem. Uh, but it is on a national scale, it is a tremendously hard thing to do. There's some points of positive, um, there's some points of hope. For instance, in Chicago, a progressive mayor was elected. Even though the Chicago Police Union um, vociferously opposed him and threatened uh, the resignation of thousands of officers if he won the mayoralty, they have yet to resign. They're still collecting their taxpayer-funded um, paychecks. So um, it is, I think it's one of the deepest problems that exists in the political dynamic of dealing with criminal justice and law enforcement. Thank you. Thank you all. We are a few minutes over time. It is just over set, over 7.30. And this conversation feels like one that I could have all night. It feels like the beginning of a conversation and hopefully of a relationship between Glide Center for Social Justice and Darwin and Ali. We would love to have you back. We would love to think through how to continue this conversation. To those of you that came out this evening to have this conversation with us. We are deeply appreciative of your time, your involvement, your willingness to read the book, your willingness to be involved in this conversation, in my opinion, is the strategy and the only thing that is going to push policing forward and to actually make reform stick. So thank you for being involved in this conversation about one of the most important civil rights and social justice issues of our time. I'm going to turn it over to Eric. I know he has a few closing words, but thank you, Darwin. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Ileana. Deep appreciation and gratitude. And thank you again to all of those who joined us this evening. Eric. Thank you, Holly. Uh, thank you, panelists. Thank you for everyone for attending. Um, just want to announce our next virtual justice event uh, to celebrate Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. It's on Thursday, May 25th, 6 to 7.30 p.m. That's the Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. 
Uh, and please don't forget to sign up to become a justice warrior at glide.org under the Center for Social Justice. And that is the end of our program. Thank you all.